I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to talk about. I, I've always been fascinated by the miracles of Yeshua and, and the way he lived. And more so when I came to this current uh, walk that I'm under. And so I'd like to start out reading from... Stan, pull the microphone closer. Hold the microphone up. Only so the video will... Just higher? No, closer to your mouth. Bring the stand. It's kind of low. I'm a little... There you go. That works. I'm a little taller than... Yes, the average Your bear. average <laughs> joke. Okay. <laughs> All right. Amen. So, um, in, in thinking about the miracles that Yeshua performed... I wanted to start out with Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 14. And it says, Yeshua returned in the power of the Ruach to the Galilee, and news about him went, went out um, all, all through the, the surrounding region. He taught in their synagogues, everyone was praising him, and he came to Nazareth, um, where he had been raised. As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on Shabbat, and he got up to read. And when the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Ruach Adonai is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to release the captives and, re and recovery of sight to the blind. Um, something you may not know, I didn't realize it until I started preparing for this Bible study, but no other prophet in the Bible was ever given the gift of restoring sight to the blind. This is something that our Father, the Creator, specifically set aside for Yeshua as a sign that He was the Son of the living God. And so as you think about the miracles that He performed, you know, you have to wonder, did he, did they have a purpose? D did he pick people at random? Did he, he didn't just heal everyone that walked by. So, um, let's take a look then at the first miracle that he performed. Um, this is, huh? One more. One more? Thank you. <laughs> Keep me on track. Uh, in John chapter 2, starting in verse 6, now there were six stone jars used for the Jewish ritual of purification, each holding two to three measures. Yeshua said to them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them up to the top. Now he said to them, take out some of the water and give it to the head waiter. And they brought it. Now the head waiter didn't know where the water had come from, but the servants who had drawn it knew. As the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, he calls the bridegroom and says to him, everyone brings the good wine first, and then when they are drunk, they bring the worst wine. But you reverse the good, reserve the good wine until now. Um, Yeshua did this, the first sign. I'll take the clicker for you so you don't have to Please do that. Right. Yeah, I was gonna go. ask you to do that, so yes. Catherine and I are on the same <laughs> wavelength. All right, so. Do it while I'm back there. If not, you can come sit up here next to me. <laughs> So this is the first miracle that Yeshua performed. And coming from my um, Baptist background, you know, I used to read this, and I would just, you know, you could just rush right over the first part of this passage where it's talking about this Jewish ritual of purification. I mean, in, in my upbringing, in my tradition, that didn't mean anything to me. Uh -huh. but, but I believe it has, it has a significant meaning. Um, these stone jars... Each held between, just so you'll know, you know, they weren't little tiny carafes. They each held between 20 and 30 gallons of water. Wow. So they held upwards of 180 gallons of water, which is the equivalent of about 900 bottles of wine. And the way this um, purification went, you know, it was after for them to wash the soap in water to get the germs off their hands. They actually would pour three times over the right hand and three times over the left hand and say this special prayer before they would eat and, and do other things. And so um, it was something that the religious leaders of the time came up with as a rule, part of their halakha, part of their daily walk, things 
that they were expected to do. Um, so let's take another look at a, a Mark 7 and, and look at this purification in a little more detail. Um, now the Pharisees and some of the Torah scholars who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Yeshua, and they saw that some of his disciples were eating bread with unclean hands, that is, not washed. For the Pharisees and the Jewish people do not eat unless they wash their hands up to the elbow, keeping the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they perform a ritual washing. There are many other traditions they have received and hold, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels. The Pharisees and Taurus scholars question Yeshua, why don't your disciples wash according to the tradition of the elders? Why do they eat bread with unwashed hands? And he, Yeshua, said to them, uh, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about me, uh, prophesy about you, hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, having left behind um, the commandments of God, you hold to the traditions of men. He was also telling them, you set aside the commandments of God in order that you may validate, validate your own tradition. Uh, this man-made commandment um, is based off of the oral law. Um, the Hebrew word for that is takanot. It's a man-made rule. Um, it's kind of like building a fence around the Torah to, to keep them from breaking this commandment. They would, uh, they would make other rules so they wouldn't even get close to breaking that 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 commandment. It, many times their intentions were right, or, or their intentions were good, but it um, obviously, it, it developed into a problem. Um, but the Pharisees and the scribes of the time, um, I think any time you have a, a, a person who receives a certain um, bit of success um, in, in life or in business, you have to keep your your pride in check. You have to make sure, I think, that you're always willing to be a servant and that you don't um, let it go to your head. And, and I think from the actions and the words of Yeshua, this was a real problem they were dealing with then. Um, the, many of the rabbis, the Pharisees, were trying to um, control the people rather than teach um, and love on them. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded often of Deuteronomy 4.2, and it says, You must not add to the word that I am commanding you, or take away from it, in order to keep the mitzvot of Adonai your God that I'm commanding you. So it's important to keep his word, but you don't want to you don't want to you don't want to add to it. You want to do just what he says to do. Um, I, I'm reminded of um, Matthew chapter 7. Where it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will de declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. So obviously we're supposed to do things, but we need to do the word according to, the, to God's instructions and not according to man's. Um, so how does this apply to his miracles? I think that first miracle that he performed, he was kind of like stubbing his finger at the Pharisees saying, you know, you, you've got this man-made tradition of these washing of the hands and all, and he took those vessels which um, supplied the water to that ritual and he turned it, turned it into wine. Uh, uh, completely different purpose than what they had intended it for. Um, um, one other thing, in, uh, towards the end of Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 28-29, when Yeshua had finished these words, the crowds were astounded at his teachings, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not like their Torah scholars. So they, he wasn't trying to rule over them. Um, he was trying to teach them to the, you know, you heard it said that the, he came to fulfill the law. He came to 
preach it to a full understanding. He wasn't trying to inundate them with rules and uh, burdensome, you know, we know his, his burden is life. It's not a heavy yoke, it's a joy. Um, it's, it's life, it's freedom. Um, it's not so difficult that somebody has to go up into the heavens to get it, to do it. Um, so Yeshua taught a complete understanding of the law and taught them how to rightly keep the law, the law as opposed to um, making it being a, a burden. In, in Matthew 11, um, in verse 12, it says, from the, from the days of John the Immerser until now, the kingdom of heaven is treated with violence, and violent men grasp hold of it. I think that many of the religious leaders of that time were, they were obviously violent men. They, they crucified him for his beliefs and for his actions. And um, not only then, but even today, people are so quick to persecute someone else whose belief system is different than, than, than ours or, or yours. Um, and look throughout history, many, many violent and murderous things have been done in the name of believers, in the name of Christianity. And so um, I think violent men have a tendency to take the word and use it for their own personal gain rather than the way it was intended. In John chapter 5, starting in verse 5, it says, Now a certain man had been an invalid for 38 years. Seeing him lying there, and knowing he had been there a long time, you should have said to him, Do you want to get well? No. And the invalid answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool of water when it's stirred up. While I'm trying to get in, someone else steps in before me. Yeshua tells him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And immediately the man was healed. He took up his mat and started walking around. Now that day was the, the Shabbat, so the Judean leaders were saying to the man who was healed, it's Shabbat, it's not permitted for you to carry your mat. So, so here Yeshua heals this man and instructs him to get up and carry his mat. And that was against the Taka note, against the oral law of the rabbis at the time, of the time because that was considered work. Um, it's not considered work in the Torah, but they're, according to their man-made definition of work. Um, so, so this miracle, Yeshua instructed him to do something else that was intentionally breaking the traditions of men. In John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, as Yeshua was passing by, he saw a man who had been blind since birth. His disciples asked the rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Um, that he should, and then, of course, obviously I lost my place. Um, who, who sinned, uh, uh, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Yeshua answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened so that the works of God might be brought to light in him. We must do the work of the one who sent me. So long as it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, these things, he spat on the ground, he made mud with the saliva, and he spread it on the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went away, washed, and came back seeing. Now this is an interesting miracle. Um, several things happened here. In, in, this, in this miracle, Yeshua actually tells him to break three of the traditions of men. Three takanot. First of all, it's, uh, it was against their man-made rules to make mud, to, to mix water and dirt together and make mud. That was working. So that was, that was not allowed. Applying any kind of salve to someone's eyes was not allowed according to their man-made rules. And then he told him to walk to this specific pool to wash the mud away. Now, they're right at the foot of the temple, and there is a two million gallon cistern of water right there where they are. But yet he tells him to walk half a mile away to this other pool. Now, this is just, this is right around the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of the three pilgrimage feasts. So there, there are people all over Jerusalem. So he's telling this blind guy, okay, now walk 
half a mile away with this mud all over your face. And you can imagine him, he's bumping into people. All of these people are seeing him and they're wondering what the heck is going on. And then when he finally makes it to that pool of water, he still can't see. And he washes the mud away and you can imagine his exuberance. And I can imagine him screaming, I can see, I can see. And all these people who've been watching him walk throughout the streets the last half a mile, you know, the word, the word got around. It, it made a big commotion. Um, Praise and, um, God. and Yeshua was, again, I think, you've got your man-made rules. I'll, I'll show you how it's really done. Um, I, I think he was directly attacking their religious system by many of these miracles which they were doing. In, in my tradition, I was always taught, and I, I, I read into the scriptures. I thought that Yeshua, the, you know, I used to say, you know, he is my Sabbath rest, you know. He, he broke the Sabbath. Uh, it, it's the way that I, it was explained to me. Um, that's in Matthew chapter 12. Let's read that now. It says, at that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on Shabbat. His disciples became hungry, and he began to pluck heads of grain and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not permitted on Shabbat. So, so when I used to read that, I thought, see, he, he did away with the Sabbath. So he was he taught them to, to, to do that. But again, that's a talking note. It's a, it was a man-made tradition not to pull those heads of grain and eat them. So in actuality, Yeshua never broke any of the commandments. If he did, he could not have qualified as the Messiah. Um, and then in Matthew 23, starting in verse 1, um, Yeshua spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The Torah scholars and Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. So whatever they tell you, do and observe. But don't, but don't do what they do, for what they say they do not do. Yeah, this is this has always been confusing to me. Um, um, the early church fathers, you know, we have um, we have copies of the the book of Matthew written in Hebrew. There's over twenty some odd manuscripts, and many of the early fathers of the faith. Um, they, they, they've written and they, they're recorded um, as um, saying that the book of Matthew was first written in Hebrew and then best transcribed into other languages as best they could. Uh, Papias, who was one of John's disciples who lived from 150 to 170 AD, said this. Irenaeus, from 120 to 202 is when he lived. He was a disciple. Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, he said this. Uh, Origen was an early church scholar, and so was Eusebius. Um, he lived from 265 to 340. He was a church historian. Now, I think it's helpful when you read scripture. I hope that you look at different translations of the Bible. There are things you can glean. Now, I don't think you need to go take your Greek-inspired, Greek-translated Matthew and rip it out of your Bible and replace it with the Hebrew Matthew. But I think there are things that can be gleaned from a closer examination of um, the book of Matthew written in Hebrew. One problem I've always had with this passage is that in these first three verses of Matthew 23, Yeshua says, do what these scribes and Pharisees tell you to do. But then he spends the whole rest of the chapter telling you what horrible doctrine they have and what, uh, the, how, how they, the, you know, the total opposite of what the first three verses say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I believe there's a reason for this. And verse 3 in Greek says, whatever they, the Pharisees, tell you, do it and observe. However, if you read this in Hebrew, it says something completely different. It says, whatever he, Moses, tells you, that you do and observe. This is one Hebrew letter, a vav, changes the meaning of that from do what they, the rabbis, tell you 
to do what he, Moses, has told you in, in his holy word. And then he goes on to say, um, in the rest of that, that chapter, I mean, he, he gets on to the Pharisees with their teachings and their conduct. Um, he tells you that they tie heavy loads that are hard to carry. They lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They love the place of honor at all the feasts and all the best seats in the synagogue. He says, the greatest among you shall be your servant, but whoever exalts himself, it's for your own selfish desires, whoever exalts himself, um, be least. Yeah, whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. He goes on to tell him, you blind guides, you strain a gnat while swallowing a camel. Now, this is kind of interesting. Have you ever thought about this verse? You strain a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Well, both a camel and a gnat are not kosher. And, and the water, the wine they drank in those days, they watered it down with water. And, and you can imagine the gnats and the flies that would gather around the cup. So they were so worried about the minutia, the small things, that they were afraid to swallow a gnat. So they would sit their wine through their teeth and spit out the gnats. <laughs> but, yet, but yet, they're eating the largest unkosher can, uh, animal in Israel. So that, that's kind of what that illustration is talking about there. You, you wow. strain the man, but you eat the camel. It goes on to say, O blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside may become clean as well. Woe to you, Torah scholars and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. They look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, you appear righteous on the outside, but are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Um, obviously, when you read the book of Matthew through a Hebraic lens, the first three verses make perfect sense with the rest of the book. Um, um, I think the prideful arrogance of the religious leaders is reflected in the writings of the Talmud. Um, Ra uh, Rashi and Nemanides both wrote that even if he, the, you know, your, your rabbi, your leader, tells you that about the right, that it is really the left, or if they tell you that the left is really the right, they must be obeyed. Um, so this is reflective of the sign of the times. You, you did what they told you to do, whether it agreed with Torah or it didn't. Um, there, there's another writing in the Talmud that, talk, that gives you instructions speaking about uh, straining mats, that first you must put on your right shoe, but not tie it. And then you put on your left shoe and not tie it. And then you go back and you tie your right shoe. And then you go back and you tie your left shoe. I mean, they had all this minutia, burdensome man-made rules, but yet they, they discounted the word of God in, in many ways. I think that you and I have a responsibility to read the word and to be accountable for our beliefs and our actions. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, I, I really try to chill more when I'm giving my testimony in public. Um, you catch more bees with the honey. But it's, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what your spouse or your parents or your grandparents, what their traditions were. When you get there, to that judgment seat, there's only going to be two chairs. And you're going to be in one of them, and Yeshua's going to be in the other one. And it reminds me of Matthew 23, um, um, where he says, um, For I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, Baruch Haba, the Shem Adonai, blessed is the name of the Lord. He this, this is how Matthew 23 ends. He's got good news coming for us, but you, you need to be accountable for what you read, and you need to um, 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 we need to read the word for ourselves yes. and, um, and, and, and ask the Ruach to give us guidance. And we're blessed here because we do have good leadership. Um, I don't think any two men are going to ever agree on anything, but but we can we can encourage each other and lift each other up, yes. and um, 
I've never seen a more loving community than what we have here at Brit Island. And, and um, I, I mean that. Um, an interesting thing in, um, right now we're at the end of chapter 23 in this Bible study, but the very next thing Yeshua says in chapter 24 is that many will come in my name saying that I am the Messiah and will lead many astray. And, you know, when I used to read that, I'd think that we're going to have all these um, Charles Mansons come in and say, I'm the Messiah. But, but as I have, um, I think, read this through a different lens, um, I'm going to paraphrase it and tell you what I think it says in Stan's version. Um, For many preachers will preach in my name, saying that Jesus is the Messiah, and they will lead many people astray. So often today in churchianity, we hear people doing God's things in their own way um, and taking things that are rooted in evil or rooted in paganism, and they try to baptize them and bring them into the church. And I think back to the story of Nadab and Abihu, you know, those were Aaron's two sons, and they tried to do God's things in man's ways. And we remember what happened to them. He, He... struck them dead right where they stood. Um, um, I don't know why I put that at the end of this. I really wanted to end on a positive thing. But we, what we do is important, not, not to earn our salvation, but to show people what's in our heart. And That's we right. have to love each other. That's right. We have to... Um, yes. We have to love God, and that's the most important commandment. And the second one is like this, um, love your neighbor as yourself. So um, I, um, as I look back at the miracles that he performed, I think they did have a purpose. And I think he was trying to get people's attention um, to turn your eyes always toward the Father and follow his word and not the traditions of men. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. I almost called you Rabbi Stan. (laughs) (laughs) Stan, uh, is that on? Okay, you can leave it on. Stan taught me two things that I never paid attention to before tonight. So I appreciate that. One, I never paid attention that uh, the three or four miracles that he shared with us tonight all began with purification water. I'd never paid attention that the the Mm. wine was turned into water, it was purification, and the blind, he went to the, I was at the purification pool, and the lame man was at the purification pool. I never had connected that all of these miracles that Yeshua did started with people being at a place of purification. Mm. And it made me think about how, you know, that's how God works, is when we get to a place where we allow him to purify us, and then he can work miracles in us. So thank you so much for yes, that. The other one was, terrific. this one here, I had never paid attention to this this way before. But I think this, you know, we always talk about Yeshua's not going to come back until the Jewish people say, Baruch HaBab HaShem Adonai, you won't see me again. And we always pre- teach this in a prophetic way, and I think it is prophetic. But I think Yeshua was also telling those people, you're not going to see who I am. I mean, in the context of what's going on, they have... Say, set aside Moses. They have their own things. And he's mm-hmm. saying, until you recognize who I am, until you say, blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, Yeshua said, I am come in my Father's name. I'm here. Blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord. You're not able to see me. And so I'd never have noticed that until you brought it out to, tonight in this. So thank you so much for, uh, oh, for sharing this. Beautiful revelation. What a yes. blessing. Amen. Mm-hmm. Catherine. Um, how far away is Siloam from where It's about half a mile, but it's a, a difficult half a mile. We, we actually go there when we go to Israel, and you have to go around, and it's all mountain and rocky, and it's, it's a, well, a schlep. What was the pool we went to when we went through the tunnel? That's at Hezekiah's tunnel, and it goes in a different one. Yeah. So how far away is that one? That's at the city of David, and Pula Salom is at the base of the city of David. Okay. Related to that, when there was a... The pool that they recently discovered the 
the walk that goes up to the temple. Right. And so they would have said that they, like where they got the water and then they went up. Is that one of these pieces of water that we're talking about? Yeah, so it's really neat. I, I had never paid attention to how involved the purification water was to these miracles, but every one of them you brought out begins with uh, purification pools or purification jars and, and all that, so that's pretty cool. I had never really understood the gnats and the camel, but when, um, you know, Stan <laughs> gave us a pretty good picture of them <laughs> with the gnats and straight, yeah. <laughs> but they'll eat on kosher stuff, that was good. <coughs> It really was. Anyone else? <coughs> Seth? How necessary was it that he would tell them their sins are forgiven before he would sometimes perform a miracle? The That's a good question. I don't know that it was necessary, but I think it was a way of him saying, you know, in one case, is, is it harder for me to perform a miracle to say your sins are forgiven? So I think it was a demonstration of his deity in doing that. So I think it was important for that thing, but I don't think it was a prerequisite uh, that sins were forgiven in order to be healed, or else there's a lot of people that God's healed that never did turn to him uh, in that way. So anybody else real quick? Yes. Uh, this is nothing. I was thinking um, I told Hosanna, when the blind man was told to go wash in the pool, I think it took a lot longer than because he was blind to get. <laughs> yeah, it was. It took so a it, to get there to begin with. It's yeah. a walk over <laughs> it's it's So it will be a while not, before you. You know, it, Jerusalem's not like Pensacola. Yeah. You don't. You can't see one end to the other because of the hills and all that that's in there, and walking up and down and huge rocks you got to crawl over, and uh, so it, it's a significant journey. Especially for someone who's blind, yeah, uh, to do that. Well, somebody maybe have helped them. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have. Wanted well, I mean, to there help may have been somebody that helped them, but even if you're helping a blind man, it's still, still a trick. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the context where Yeshua was talking about, was confronting the scribes and Pharisees about, you know, the baptism of John? Was it from from heaven or from man? Um, where did that come? I'm not sure what your question is. I can't. I can't think of the scripture verse, but um. um but there's a scripture verse where Yeshua was confronting scribes and Pharisees about the baptism, about baptism. Right. And then he said, um, um, he said, Yeah, he asked, is, it, is John baptism of his own doing or is this of God? He was just dividing them because they'd argue amongst themselves over things like that. So if you say it's, a, it's of John, then you're saying it's not of God. If you're saying it, then all the disciples of John would get upset. And so it was a, just a way of, and then they get arguing amongst themselves if you read the scripture. And then he just walks away. And um, what about the scripture reference where Herod's daughter, um, where um, Herod's daughter was dancing, and, 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 and that one wish where um, she had she had John the Baptist's head, you know, you know, decapitated. I'm not sure what that has to do with the. Where where does that fit into this? Oh, okay. It just popped in my head. I'm sorry. Okay. So, to do with anybody you. else? Timothy, if you don't mind. I I was recently watching a teaching and I saw this and it came in when he was talking about the miracles and talking about the Judean leaders. Uh, this other teaching that I saw points out that in a lot of the ESV, the NIV, these other scripture translations, they will say, and the Jews, or and the Jews, Jews, right. Jews. But if you, and I even looked up the Greek word, and the Greek word in those places is supposed to actually indicate it means the Judean leaders. Right. And I appreciate that the Tree of Life version points that out because it changes the entire context of everything that, even in my in most yes. of our past yes. readings, it you know, says, yes. and the Jews, and it feels like they're criticizing every Jew. In, in, mm -hmm. in the, the principles, the translating principles to the TLV, and they're in the TLV somewhere, you can find the uh, AS 13 principles for translating. One of those was to uh, translate properly so that it didn't broad brush all Jewish people in a negative when it's the Judean leaders or, or and so on. Yeah. So that's an important distinction in the in translating. Yeah. Anyone else real quick before we uh, we, uh, we leave? I, I once again thank you, Stan. Uh, thank you, Stan. I, I have not seen before study. and now I have something to write a blog on next.
<laughs> this is a win-win. So, uh, please remember to pray for Sylvia, for Robin, for Fred, for Martin, uh, for Sam and Joanne. Uh, yes. Yeah, you can turn that off. <laughs>